My name is Mike Hines, and I work for Amazon. And I'm pretty fortunate in that I've gotten to work with our partners in Twitch, in Nuzu, and our own Amazon App Store research team to come up with a bunch of really interesting data that I'd like to share with you guys about competitive gaming. Now, I really like the panel that was up here just a few minutes ago, because they were talking quite accurately that eSports e is just sort of a trade name or a brand name uh, really for what is competitive gaming. So what is competitive gaming? Well, really, it's, it's any game that two people play real time against each other. And sure, when we think about competitive gaming, we think about the big franchises and eSports, but really, it's a lot of games that we've been playing and playing for centuries, like ch chess or Go or checkers or, you know, um, tic-tac-toe even. So competitive gaming is really a thing. Now, of course, when you hear about competitive gaming and esports on a stage like this, naturally you do think about the esports franchises. So how does your competitive game become an esport? Well, it really helps if you can fill an entire auditorium full of people who want to watch you play your game. You might be an eSport. If you stream on Twitch and thousands of people start watching people play your game, you might be an eSport. And so let's talk about you know, what that is, because a big part of starting your game off as an eSport happens on Twitch. Okay, how many people have watched a game on Twitch before? Okay, so there is actually a hand or two that didn't go up. Either you had turkey for lunch and you're sleeping, but I'll go ahead and give you a quick review anyway. Twitch is a way that you can stream the games that you play, including competitive games you play with other people. Twitch has a couple really important components. There's a guy in the lower left-hand side there. He's the guy streaming the game, which you see in the center with the airplane. While people on the right, all the viewers, chat with themselves, chat with a streamer, and the streamer can actually chat back. And this is a way that you can get people not just kind of sitting and watching a sport, like maybe football or basketball, but actually kind of participating in that sport. And it's, you know, it's not just the franchises. Yes, they have a majority of the viewers, but it's anything that can be competitive, including something like poker. I mean, this guy actually is a really, really good poker player. So thousands of people turn him on on Twitch to watch how he plays against other people. So in that case, they're trying to learn as much as they're enjoying watching. And that's another really great aspect about eSports. If someone's interested in the game, they can watch other people play to learn how to get better at it. So when I talk about these other people, who are they and where are they? Well, this is the audience particip participation part of our game. Um, are you guys ready? How many million man hours did it take to build the Great Pyramid of Giza? Any guesses? All right, I'll give you this one. About 33 million hours. How many millions of hours did we spend watching the most popular YouTube video? Yeah, OK, it's embarrassing. Um, actually, when I created this slide, it was uh, about 140 million hours for um, you know, Gangnam Time. It's not true anymore. Another music video out of Latin America now has about 250 million hours of YouTube watch time. But you know, back in the States, I can almost always count on people knowing March Madness. You guys heard about the college basketball tournament, March Madness? Any of you? Oh, come on. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. All right. How many millions of hours did we spend watching a collegiate basketball tournament? <laughs> yeah, about 640 million hours watching basketball. Okay, well, it's a real sport, technically. It's, uh, it's, on, it's got the NBA. It's on a network. How many millions of hours did we spend watching other people play video games? I won't keep you in suspense. 4.8 billion hours. Think about that. 4.8 billion hours. And not all of it was spent watching the franchises either. There was a fair amount spent watching poker and other people's brand new games. Heck, people even watch people developing video games on Twitch. 
So these people who spend all this time doing it, where are they coming from? Well, a little bit over half of them are coming from Asia Pacific. The other half evenly distributed between the United States, sorry, North America, European Union, and the rest of the world. So that's where they're coming from. Now, how much are they, you know, and, and, and kind of taking a look at this audience, you know, I want to share some of the shape of that audience with you. So let's take a look at 2017, uh, kind of the third one over from the left there. There, you know, we've got uh, the 191 hardcore users, uh, you know, people who are playing the games and watching the games. But for the first time this year, we have more casual eSport viewers than people who are hardcore viewers or hardcore players. What this means is more people will watch an eSport event maybe once a week as opposed to watch them and play them several times a week. And that only is going to increase, about 20% compound annual growth until 2020. And that is huge, and it's really appealing. Now, a couple panels ago, or maybe it was this last panel, they were kind of talking about what, you know, what it looks like now. We've kind of gone from the early stages of esports to what someone called esports 2.0. Well, it's you know, we think of it a little bit differently, and not really eSports 2.0, but we're out of eSports childhood, and we're kind of into an adolescent phase. And yes, eSports is going to continue to grow. The only question is how fast it's going to keep growing. And so here are some things we think we need to look at to determine whether it's going to grow quickly or, or slowly. First of all, everyone's been talking about the Overwatch franchise. The success of that franchise is going to be really important. It's one of the key indicators of whether or not we're going to grow moderately quickly or super quickly. Another thing uh, you know, continues to be franchising in local leagues. Also, think about regulations. Not government regulations, but I'm talking about the infield fly rule for League of Legends. You know, the roughing the kicker rule for Overwatch. When we start seeing official rules and regulations that govern the playing of esports, we'll know that the leagues are getting serious and that people are getting hardcore about the competition. So take a look at for, for those things starting to happen. Also take a look at um, media rights and sponsorship, because these are going to be big signals about whether we're growing slowly to reach about 1.1 billion by 2020, or whether we're going to grow super quickly and look at about 2.4 billion in 2020. All right, 2.4 billion. Actually, that's a lot of revenue. So who is actually investing in this? Who's spending the money? Well, let's start by taking a look at who's actually looking for a new market. Look who's you know, losing customers. ESPN is losing 200,000 customers a month. Ouch. And I mean, this is the previously high revenue sports that, that are losing viewers. What kind of viewers? Primarily millennials. Men between the ages of 22 and 35 are dropping off, you know, in droves. And, you know, People like Netflix founder are, are saying it's only natural because, I mean, at one point, fax machines were really cool, right? Who still uses one? Yeah, not, not so much anymore, right? So competitive games and esports are kind of picking up the slack. One of the things that we found when we were looking at where these people are coming from and where they're going was pretty interesting to me. Um, there was a question over here earlier about esports on mobile devices. Was that you? Yeah, okay, thank you for asking that. One of the things that we found was that while about 21% of the average customer will watch all of their video on a mobile device, 49% of people who watch eSports will watch all of their video um, on a mobile device. And that's impressive because people are watching and they're starting to play on mobile devices. I mean, the games he listed earlier were great. Uh, Hearthstone, we're looking at um, Vainglory. All of those are, are absolutely part of the study that we did. So that's a solid answer. And mobile means that there's an opportunity for a lot more developers out there to build games that can be, well, certainly good competitive gaming games, but potentially esports qualifying games. So let's dig a little bit farther down to see what kind of good business this is and who's actually spending the money. 
Um, please excuse the very dense slide here. Uh, I'll just kind of walk you through some of the parts that I, I really like. For example, 22% uh, of men in the US age 21 to 35 uh, watch esports frequently, more frequently than they watch hockey and basketball together. Okay, seriously cool data there. Another thing that I like is of the player, of the people who watch esports, 40% of them don't play the sports that they watch. It's honestly becoming a viewer based franchise. It's becoming a viewer based thing. It's not just the players who are watching other games. So it's kind of broadening in a lot of its appeal. And if esports reaches the level of viewer spending that the NBA currently has, we'd be at a $3 billion industry right now. So that's pretty cool. And a lot of that's going to come from industries like Coke, like Red Bull, like Arby's, MasterCard, Intel. I mean, these are major name brands that, that sponsor NBA, NFL, and, and other professional franchises right now. So how does that actually cause the revenue split? What, what is the revenue split going to look like when we, when we take a look at contributors here? Not a lot of it is actually coming from in-game spend. You're not going to generate this money from in-app purchasing. Most of this is actually coming from brand investments. It's coming from media rights. It's coming from advertising. It's coming from franchise deals. And, and that is going to be a majority of the spend and a majority of the revenue coming in for esports. So it's going to be at a fairly high level institutionally and a high level organizationally. Um, other things are going to be coming from ticket sales, publishers' fees, uh, and, and cooperative deals, but that's going to be a fairly small part of the revenue. That said, the revenue is probably going to grow at about 35% compound annual growth rate. So there's going to be a pretty big chunk of money out there to pull from, even if we just grow at that kind of moderate in-between level during esports adolescence. So if that's how we're going to split the revenue between you know, big spenders, big contributors, where is that revenue coming from? In other words, where is a good place to invest in competitive gaming moving forward? Most of the spend you're going to see is actually coming from South Korea. The guy up here, uh, uh, Robert, who is doing most of his work in Seoul, smart guy, actually, because that's where a majority of the revenue uh, is going to come from. Less revenues, a little bit less revenue is going to come from North America, uh, and then we split the rest up between China and the rest of the world. So a lot of the hot markets that a lot of people want to be into, you can get there through competitive gaming and esports. Okay, I say you can get there, but what does that mean really? I mean, what would your next steps be uh, to get there? So if you haven't already, get a Twitch account, watch a lot of Twitch games. And think about when you want to develop your game and you want to facilitate either a grassroots up eSport or kind of a publisher down, hopefully you can get to a big publisher and they'll want to sponsor a, a really big team out of this, to get to a top down area. In both cases, one of the things that your game is going to need is context. Imagine watching a basketball game and you see a guy in a white jersey, you know, the ball is just off of his fingertips, and you see a bunch of people in blue jerseys, you know, looking up at the ball as it flies towards the net. You see this all the time when you watch basketball, right? What's the big deal? Until you find out that the game is the national championship game, the score is tied, and there is two-tenths of a second left on the game clock. Now that shot means a whole lot more to you as a viewer, doesn't it? That context now that that shot has is make or break for a team in the national championships. So think about your game. When someone comes and looks at the Twitch channel for about five seconds, do they get the context of your game? Do they see where it is in progress? Do they know who's on whose team? Who's ahead? Do they know what's at stake? When you're designing for competitive gameplay in esports, the customer, the viewer, has to be able to get the context of what's happening and why it's important in about two seconds. Think about how other professional sports do it on television and, and see what common traits they have. And think about doing that yourself. Um, second thing is, when you're designing for streaming, 
uh, which is currently critical for esports adoption. Think about how Twitch actually works. Remember the screen I showed you earlier where we had the guy on the left, the game in the middle, and the, and the chat screen on the right-hand side? If that's happening with your game, is anything really important being occluded? Uh, we were actually just out here talking to Top Hat. Uh, if you haven't played it, it's the one where you try to take your character and you jump on other people's hats and you throw your hat at other people. It's a fun game. It really is. But when they were showing the score, it was blocking people's ability to get to their hat. It was blocking some of the gameplay. Imagine if you had a streamer, you had some context down there, and you had a Twitch stream. It would block a lot of the game field. The solution is to shrink the game field to make room for these things that are going to make it interactive and possible to keep and retain context in the game. That's what I want you guys to think about doing when you think about building games out for esports and, and for competitive gaming. Empower the community, help them create competitions and tournaments, and you know, think about how you're going to approach that. Do you want to try mobile, which is kind of new and exciting and a lot of people are investing in? Do you want to go console? Whatever you do, try to develop with that streaming first customer focused lens and you should be in good shape. All right, it's been really fun for me to be up here to talk to you guys. There are a bunch of other things I'd like to tell you if I had more time. Uh, fortunately, I have that all in a book. Now, <laughs> you can go up here to the book and you can download the PDF, but there is a special opportunity we have. There are actually copies of this book, hard copies of this book, at the Apodil stand. So if you guys all rush out and get it, to go to the Apodil stand, grab yourself a book, uh, and then run to the Indie Prize Awards. In the meantime, it's been my pleasure to talk to you guys about the data behind esports. Thank you very much for your time.